In today's show, two convertibles that really act to bookend the whole story of MG sports cars. First, we look at a true classic and get the philosophical view on its handling. If you're an enthusiast and you like MGs, they drive well, mentally anyway. It feels good. And that's what it feels to me, to be honest. It's a 1939 MG TA, lovingly restored by Bill Riding. Then, later on, another MG not renowned for going round corners terribly well. And by the time this retro-style ragtop was launched, its development team had been raiding more than a few parts bins for components that might fit. The wing mirrors are from a Metro. And it wasn't just British parts they wombled either, as we'll see later when we take a closer look at the RV8, arguably the last classic MG Roadster. could be more delightful. A classic open-top sports car in the English summertime. And yep, it's raining. Which for less hardy passengers may be a bit of a problem, as putting up the rag top is a long job. The theory is, if you keep moving forward, only a little rain will fall on you. Anyway, it didn't rain all day, so we had a chance to talk to owner and restorer Bill Riding. The car is something that I wanted for years and years, and I got it in mid to late 90s. Um, not in the state you see now. It was generally towed here, what could be towed, and the rest in boxes. And it's been built up uh, within a year of uh, arriving here, and now it's running most days. I wanted a 1939 TA because I was born in 1939. And from the, uh, the records I've studied from the T register, I find that this car was built in April 1939, and so was I, born in 1939, which uh, so this uh, were uh, quite closely connected. The MG T-Type, as it was originally called, was launched in 1936 to replace the P-Series cars and was basically an evolutionary design, being wider and longer than the model it replaced, costing the princely sum of £222 in 1936 which is actually an awful lot of money then. Just over 3,000 were made up until 1939, making this particular car one of the last off the line. The engine was 1300cc with twin SU carburetors delivering 50 horsepower. There was a four-speed box with synchromesh on third and fourth. Hydraulic brakes were also fitted, an upgrade from the outgoing model which had cable-operated brakes. The uh, cooling was always a problem right right from its uh, right from its birthday uh, the fan was a four blade steel fan with about a five degree pitch which uh, basically functioned very poorly right uh, a lovely invention was the seven blade fan of the 1960 i think it's either 60 62 mgb uh, which is fitted on here it's an acceptable <laughs> as far as i'm concerned modification it cools the engine and uh, it's just incredible the spacings with the bolt spacings are exactly the same from 1939 to 1962 for the uh, for the, for the for the plastic fan the other one was the uh, which i did myself it's not an invention more of a addition to this on the on the b and on the c engines they've all got a sort of baffle a heat transfer baffle between the exhaust and the uh, carburetors being both on the same side of the engine so I put a aluminium single aluminium sheet baffle on here which did help uh, but that together with the fan uh, cools it considerably and it works now yeah so pity it wasn't invented earlier maybe we'd, we'd have had a few more TAs on the road yeah, basically it was uh, I suppose you could describe it as, as, as looking at kids' toys from, from that period, which held together with little metal flaps that bent over and held them together. The manufacturer of this, this car was uh, pretty similar, which was the technology, I suppose, of the time. I don't think it was built purposely to last for a long period. So uh, what you saw is what you got. And what it said was on the tin, in other words. 
Well, TAs uh, run from, I think, 30, 36 to 39. Uh, TBs started in 1939 with a short run just before production at Abingdon stopped and they went on to uh, raw, raw products. They made small, lightweight tanks. Uh, so there's a short run of TBs. I think TA's manufacturing numbers, it's either 150 or 170 odd uh, manufactured in 39, of which I think 86 were exported to uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and uh, Europe. So uh, the remnants that, that were left in the UK were pretty limited. And I've no idea, other than T-Register, I think there's probably about uh, 20, 30 in UK today. Pretty much standard. Um, but the temperature gauge, they were fitted to the uh, Tickfords, not to this model. I fitted that for obvious reasons, which we spoke about. The, uh, the wheels, the outer lace wheels, were probably earlier, but it had three on when I got it. So I, I like the shape of them. They, they went out about 37, replaced with centre spokes, but I've, uh, I've got another two made, and uh, so it's got the outer laced spokes. Um, everything else is pretty standard. The uh, modifications we spoke about, the ones who were acceptable modifications on the engine, uh, or in the engine bay, are, uh, are recent additions. Mainly, mainly cooling. Despite its modest power output, the TA keeps up well with modern traffic, notwithstanding its on-paper figures of 0 to 60 in just over 23 seconds and a top speed of 80 miles per hour. MGs of the period had a steel body on a wooden ash frame. At the time, this was the conventional way of building small car bodies, a practice still carried on to this day by Morgan. But as owner Bill says, they probably weren't designed to last 75 years, and this TA has been extensively restored to get it to its current immaculate condition. But it's been more than just a restoration. Bill has loads of spares for it now as well, including a complete engine. Yeah, I've been collecting bits for this for certainly nine years. Um, I've got everything that, that I need for it, and uh, it's unfortunately sat in a garage about one and a half miles from here, waiting to be uh, in, in a workshop, waiting to be uh, put together and line board. And I've been waiting for that for three and a half years. <laughs> but it's, uh, I'm, I'm pushing the guy a little bit more now. Well, the engine uh, on this one, when I got it, the, uh, the block was cracked. Uh, so we're going mid nineties. There was some space age glue, if you will, which is an American product, two pack product. And uh, you could buy it for either aluminium, uh, wrought iron, cast iron, whatever. It was, it was a brilliant bonding me medium. And uh, I repaired this block. It's been done twice and it's still the, still, the second repair is still holding. Basically what it is, it cracks on the uh, fuel side between core plugs. And uh, it was a matter of doing a boilermaker's stitch, as it's called, each end, which is threaded and bolted so that it's hold it, held together and uh, then bonding the, with a Dremel, cut out the uh, crack area and then put the bonding material in. And uh, for goodness sake, it works. Bill uses the MG regularly, and as you can see, is used to the sometimes rather damp driving experience. But out and about, the MG is always the centre of attention something it seems you have to accept when owning a beautiful classic like this. Well, you're going to get stopped a couple of times with people asking what it is and how old it is and saying how beautiful it is and things like that. Uh, so it's, it's pleasant from that side. In other words, I put a lot of effort into reproducing it and it's nice to see people appreciate um, the efforts that you, you've, 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 you've made. So. Uh, I like it for that side. It's, it's not a sort of pat on the shoulder and praise, it's just that I, lo I love old cars and um, it's nice to see that people, people are entertained when they see them. If you're an enthusiast and you like MGs, right, they drive well mentally anyway, it feels good. 
and that's what it feels to me to be honest yeah it does drive well it keeps up with modern traffic except on motorways which you which you you avoid like the plague i guess um it's braking is uh, not modern braking but it's sufficient you just drive carefully it did it did the guts of 300 miles last weekend and it down to uh, shropshire uh, with a long run in between on the uh, it was a three-day event with a long long run on Sunday um, I don't mind I, I would take I would honestly take it anywhere I'm, I'm pretty confident now especially with the cooling modification that it's uh, it's quite capable of doing these distances MGs from the factory were available in a wide range of paint shades with different colours of trim and folding tops available. This one, in its original green paint with biscuit coloured upholstery, is quite probably the most classic of all the combinations. With its characteristic bench seat, individual bucket seats only came later, scalloped suicide doors and tiny wipers atop the windscreen frame, the TA is the archetypal British sports car of the 30s and 40s and has been featured in many films depicting the period. So how did Bill come to be such a fan of MGs? I think I've, I've, I've had in total uh, eight MGs First car was ten shilling something, right? Which was a, uh, a war, ex war department uh, Hillman four door, uh, which lasted. Uh, I spent so much time on it, refurbishing it, ignoring my father's advice that I should be looking at engine and chassis, right, and carrying on with bodywork and looking for the internal comforts. And uh, it lasted about six months before the chassis cracked. <laughs> so. So I've remembered, I hope, hope there are words of wisdom from the past. In my life, I've had MGs, um, minis, minis first and then MGs. Minis up, up to and included the best mini I ever had, which was a 1071S, which I used to race up at uh, Longton Car Club in, at uh, Longridge. And uh, then I went on to MGs and following MGs in 76th Range Rover. So uh, that's it, three, th three car experience life. And all classic British motors, none of that foreign nonsense for Bill. Only ever made in right-hand drive form, even though many cars were exported to all over the world, the TA features a large rev counter in front of the driver, while the passenger had the pleasure of knowing the miles per hour on the matching Jaeger Speedo. So, what's it like to drive, Bill? How does it make you feel? Well, in, in just a few words, it, ju it, it just makes me smile. It makes me feel happy. Uh, a lot of work into it. There's always ongoing work, right? Uh, when it gets its new engine, I'll have a spare engine. Um, and that's it. I think number one, it just makes me smile. Every time I sit in it, I look at it. Yeah. I don't go to bed at night without having a peep in the garage. <laughs> Sounds crazy, but uh, we're so close. Yeah. Born in the same month of the same year, Bill and his MGTA, Man and Machine, as kindred spirits. Now, fast forward a few decades and oh, look what's happened to MG. The once proud and innovative mark has been reduced to being used to badge slightly sporty versions of the desperate British Leyland Montego and Maestro models. But in the early 90s, a few people at Rover Special Products based in Gaten had other ideas. Of which more coming up. In the meantime, let's meet this car's lucky owner to find out more about it. My name is Godfrey Dennis. 
and I live in Preston, in the village of Longton, just outside Preston. And I'm standing in front of my MG RV8, which was manufactured in 1995. It was one of the later batches of cars with the uh, later gearbox, the R380. It was developed in the early 90s as an interim model, just before the MGF came out. And there were 2,000 cars made, and it was first introduced at the 1992 motor show. And the Japanese went overboard. They were very, very keen on the car. And so most of the 2,000 cars went over to Japan. About 1,630 cars went to Japan, and the remainder stayed in the UK. The Japanese models had air conditioning, and uh, because the, the Japanese drive on the same side as the road of the UK, they were very, very popular there. Well, the RV8 is a 3.9 V8, Rover V8 engine. Uh, they used the old three and a half litre engine and, and bored it out. It's fuel injected and uh, it has Conley leather seats, a wooden dashboard. So it's fairly upmarket and uh, it's a nice car to drive, but it's not as, as good around the corners as perhaps some of the sportier cars of the day were. The retail price was £26,000 and the motoring press panned it because for £26,000, why hasn't it got power steering? And there was some criticism of the uh, back suspension being, it wasn't independent, it was the same style as the previous MGB. And so it was felt that the car was overpriced. And comparisons were made to the TVRs of the day, which were a little bit more sportier. Um, had the same sort of sized engine and developed a little bit more power than the RV8 did. But MG countered by saying that the, they were not aiming the car at the younger driver, but more at the mature driver. And you can see their argument. From one point of view, the RV8 was more retro than most modern cars. Parts of its design were not just a homage to the old MGB, they were the old MGB. And bear in mind, that was a car launched in the 1960s. So their target market must have been people who'd had an MG in their youth. Accepting its retro style, the old panels and the new ones gel together pretty well. And you can understand the buzz in Japan with that market's liking for retro look cars. It can only have been the very high on the road price that curtailed sales there. After all, it was hardly a tax efficient K car. When I got permission from my wife to buy a V8, I found this car within 48 hours on the internet and it was being sold by a youngish man in the Wirral and I rang him up immediately and I went over to see the car at four o'clock that afternoon and as soon as he drove it out of the garage I'd made my mind up I wanted it. Of the 2000 or so cars that were made this car this particular car is number 1610 1610th model off the production line and it was exported to Japan in 95. It came back from Japan in 2002. An importer brought three back and it came back in 2002. It had done 53,000 kilometers in Japan which is a pretty small mileage and it's done approximately 5,000 miles since then. So I'm the second owner since it came back into the UK. I've owned the car since uh, 2010. The Japanese love the woodcoat green color, which is a bottle green metallic color. And so most of the cars were made in that color. Uh, if I said 1,630 cars, I wouldn't be far out. Of the rest, 250 were made in night red. 238 were made in this Oxford blue colour, which was an extra. You had to pay extra to have it in this colour. So there's about, as I say, 250 in this colour. Well, I suppose the appeal is it's, it's, a, it's a luxury car. It's a rare car. And I frequently get stopped, be it in a petrol station or wherever I am. You won't see many of these cars around. And, you know, in Preston, I suspect there's probably no more than three or four lurking around. 
Uh, I just love the sound of the V8 engine and uh, it's a pleasure to drive. It's a great cruiser car and uh, I'm, I'm touring the south of France in it this summer. The RV8's body was a combination of specially manufactured parts and heritage MGB parts. By way of an explanation, for some years previously, some MGB body parts and even complete shells had been remanufactured by British Motor Heritage for enthusiasts to rebuild their rusty classics, hence the availability of these parts. But as we'll go on to see, the specially made panels are now becoming rare, along with some of the specialised running gear. Because there are so few cars around, there aren't a great lot of spares about. But there are two main dealers, uh, Brown and & Gammon and Clive Wheatley, who do cater for the RV8 owner. But the spares are dear. They are expensive. But the engine is basically a Rover engine, and so the ancillaries are the same price as any Rover w owner would pay for, for those. The, the cost of the RV8 is where, for example, I was buying a new headlamp. That's a Porsche headlamp. It's a very expensive. The rear lights are the same. Some of the panels on it are very rare, so they are expensive. But hopefully, if you don't have an accident, well and good. But uh, apart from that, running it, well, miles per gallon is not as good as perhaps some of the modern cars. Running around town, 22, 23. But on the motorway, steady as you go, two and a half thousand revs, 30 to the gallon, even a little bit more. So it's not too bad. It's really a bulletproof car in the sense that the Rover engine is very, very reliable. Fuel injected engine, it's very, very reliable. As long as you change the oil every 12 months, because it's in inverted commas, a dirty engine. Uh, but if you change the oil every 12 months, it'll be fine. And driving around with Godfrey on our filming day, it's true that the RV8's relaxing ride gives you a great sense of well-being. It's not a car to be pushed. To be squirted from corner to corner, that would be unbecoming. Instead, you cruise along, just occasionally waving rather magnanimously perhaps to pass us by. OK, many car buffs will have spotted a few bits on this car originally from others. Here's more on that from Godfrey. The bonnet is peculiar to the RV8. The, the big hump in the middle is because of the engine plenum chamber, which is slightly higher, and uh, it was necessary to put this, make a little bit more space for it to fit. The headlamps are Porsche headlamps. You can buy them, again, but they're, they're pretty expensive. And they're in, enclosed in this glass fibre binnacle, each on either side. So these come off quite easily uh, if you need to adjust the, the headlamps for any reason. The, the doors, passenger and driver door are the same doors on an MGB Roadster. The same doors exactly. The wing mirrors are from a Metro. They were available in the in the parts bin and they use them. Well they work okay. The back the rear wings are RV8, the bumpers are RV8, but the boot lid is exactly the same boot lid as on an MGB Roadster. The wheels are RV8 wheels, special wheels only for the RV8. The RV8 has, has Connolly leather seating in it and uh, it's got a wooden dashboard and door cappings and all the RV8s have the same colour interior. The exact same stone colour interior on all the RV8s. But certainly this colour looks well with it and uh, Nightfire Red would probably be exactly the same. But they're all they all have exactly the same colour interior. This windscreen surround here is, is an original windscreen surround and it is the most important uh, thing to look for when you're buying an RV8 because the windscreen surround is very susceptible to rusting because of the mild steel brackets on this side on each of the corners. And the rusting is particularly on this corner and across here. And if you see any of that on an RV8, it's best to walk away from the car. These, are, these uh, windscreen surrounds you cannot get now. And, but you, they, there are uh, windscreen surrounds made in carbon fibre. But to have a windscreen 
surround removed and replaced will cost you around £2,000. Top down or top up, the RV8 still looks great. Really, this is what the much maligned 1974 rubber bumper MGB, the so-called federal spec car, should have looked like. Running a classic is just that, keeping it running. What's Godfrey's opinion on classics that are just kept in garages and never driven? Well, it's all very sad when somebody buys a classic car and decides to lock it away in the garage. They are, they need to be started up and moved every couple of weeks, certainly. You cannot just park it in the garage and leave it. Rubbers on it will perish. They'll go hard and brittle and they do need to be run. And it is very sad, I think, to see a classic car go into a garage and go under a dust sheet and stay there for six months, a year or whatever. Developed on a shoestring, the RV8 is testament to the enthusiasm of a small group of engineers at Rover Special Projects. Without sufficient funding to develop a whole car, they had to raid not only their own, but other manufacturers' parts bins, rather like TVR had always done. But the result is actually quite pleasing. And just because the door handles or the column stalks came from other less glamorous cars, so what? It's still got that lovely V8 burble. The MGB Roadsters and the GTs and the MGCs are a bit cheaper to buy. An RV8 you can buy between 14 and 20,000. So it's a, it's a slightly bigger investment. But having said that, some of the earlier MGs will fetch 25,000, 30,000 plus. Well, at the moment, I think the values have, have stayed about the same, but because of the rarity of the car, I suspect it will, it will rise a little bit in the future, no question about it. If you want a, a modernish MG, a modernish classic, this is a beautiful car to buy. I'm very pleased with it, and I think I'll probably keep this car for life now. The MG RV8, more than just a pastiche, as time is proving, it's a real classic and probably the last of the line of rear-wheel drive MG sports cars.